My name is Robert Fields. I'm the uh, new superintendent here at Arkansas Post. Uh, my background is uh, archaeology and history. Um, and I have to admit, I never dreamed I'd be here uh, as a superintendent or even uh, meeting such a uh, avid historian such as uh, Judge Arnold right here. I have to admit, uh, you know, reading his bio is like a who's who. And all you need to do is get on, you know, Google and, and Google his name and boom, it comes right up. So. There's a lot of lies on there too. <laughs> I don't believe all that stuff. <laughs> well, anyway, I just want to mention that uh, uh, Judge Arnold right here was born in Texarkana, uh, Texas. But I just want to say that I'm very thankful that he has uh, chosen this area to write a lot of the history. Um, he, uh, he wrote, uh, recently in 2017, he wrote this on the Arkansas coast of Louisiana. And then he also has written several other volumes, uh, like the Colonial Arkansas, uh, 1686 to 1804. And next, I wish I was this prolific, but anyway, The Rumble of a Distant Drum, I think that was your second one that came out here recently. And then also, Unequal Laws Unto a Savage Race, European Legal Traditions in Arkansas, from 1686 to 1836. Uh, he has such a, a broad background. I'm just going to kind of give you a very brief summation. But he received his Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering in 1965 from the University of Arkansas, Bachelor of Laws. In 68 uh, from the, the University of Arkansas School of Law, Masters of Laws in 69 from Harvard Law School, a Doctor of Juris, uh, uh, Juridical Science in 17, I mean in 1971 uh, from, from the same institution. Uh, he entered private practice in Texarkana, Arkansas in 68. Uh, he was a Uh, a teaching fellow in law at Harvard University from 69 to 70. He was a professor at Indiana University, uh, Marauder School of Law from 71 to, se I mean, for, yeah, 71 to 77. He was vice president of the University of Pennsylvania and a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School from 77 to 81. He was a professor at William H. Bowden School of Law from 81 to 84. He returned to private practice in Little Rock, Arkansas from 81 to 84. Uh, he was Special Chief Justice of the Arkansas Supreme Court in 82. He was a Special Master of the Chancellery uh, Court of Pulaski County, uh, Arkansas in 83. He was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School from uh, 84 to 85. He was a visiting professor at Stanford Law in 85. Dean of the Indiana University Marauder School of Law in 85. Um, also uh, presiding judge of the United States Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Council of Review uh, from uh, 2012 to 2013. I, I mean, it's just a who's who, but I want to say thank you for taking the time to come and, uh, and join us today and giving us a presentation. Uh, and also, if you ever get a chance, check out his books that he wrote. I'm going to have him sign them before he leaves. So, thank you for coming Thanks today. Very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be back. I sort of consider this my hometown. It's certainly my favorite place in the world because I spent a lot of time here, both physically and in my imagination trying to figure out exactly what the place was like uh, 300 years ago and more when it was founded in 1686. Uh, we're here today to commemorate the 239th anniversary of an American Revolutionary War battle, which was fought actually about six days ago now, right here on this spot. Um, and, uh, and so I want to tell you a little bit about what the place was like, who was here, uh, what they were doing here, how the battle was waged, and uh, how it came out. So if you would, you please change the slide. Let me show you, first of all, where we are. Change. Change. Uh, there we go. Okay. 
Okay, great. This is where we are right now. You can see Arkansas Post is right in the middle of the world. It really was in the middle of Louisiana. Let's remember that Louisiana ran from, well, in the beginning, including Mobile, uh, uh, not, 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 the, not, not when we are, but not at the time that we're talking about. But uh, the, the, the capital, of course, was in New Orleans, and then the economy ran all the way up to Mississippi River, believe it or not, to Fort de Chart and uh, uh, in uh, Illinois, and of course this, uh, this map doesn't show it, but St. Louis and San Genevieve are around here. So you can see that between Natchez and the Illinois country, maybe 800 miles of river, maybe more, the only European settlement in the entire colony of Louisiana for most of the time was Arkansas Post. In fact, Arkansas Post predated Louisiana. It was here, there was a Canadian outpost. It was the southern uh, and westernmost outpost of Canada. Uh, and uh, let me sort of uh, focus in, zoom in now, and I have the next slide, and I'll show you a little more, in a little more detail about where we are. Here's Arkansas Post on the Arkansas River, you'll recognize it. Goes into the Mississippi, goes into the Mississippi, runs along here. Over here is Chickasaw Bluffs. That was not actually a settlement, but it was. This, this is the site of uh, Memphis today, and it was used by the Chickasaw Indians who lived over here uh, as their main access to the Mississippi River. Although they had pathways out here, they used this as a great. It was. It was a great uh, lookout spot, as you know. The bluff at, at Memphis is very tall, so it was a strategic uh, point in the river to control river traffic, and that's exactly what they did. Across from the mouth of the White River, uh, the English established a post about 1766 that they called Concordia. Uh, this was part of West Florida at this time. Uh, and we'll talk about what happened to it in a moment. But it was a tiny outpost, and it was mainly there to try to draw the Quapaw Indians away from the people at Arkansas Post. In other words, Arkansas Post and Concordia were in competition. Concordia was part of West Florida, part of the British colonies, in other words. Arkansas Post was at this time part of Louisiana, and Spain ruled, or claimed to rule over the Arkansas region at this time. So what you had was England over here and Spain over here, okay? The Quapaw Indians were extremely important to the Arkansas Post, and they lived with their uh, French and Spanish neighbors more or less in harmony for six generations, and there's a certain amount of intermarriage. This insert up here shows you where the three Quapaw villages were. You can see one was just across the river from Arkansas Post. Here's Concordia over here. You see, this is England, this is Spain, okay? So this is an international border. Uh, change, please. Now, this is even more focused. This is Arkansas Post itself. This is the Arkansas Post band. This is Post Bio here. This is the peninsula, most of which is still there. This map was drawn in 1779, uh, and it shows the fort. I think most of the fort uh, site is still uh, above water. This bend now, of course, is, just, is a bio, is a backwater. The river runs this way. Uh, and this was the French settlement of the Spanish. It was a, it was, it was, a, it was a Spanish settlement in the sense that this was Spanish territory. But almost all the white people who lived here were French. Mm. Uh, and this actually shows a, a little American settlement up here. These were people who were refugees from the American Revolution. And then the Quapaw Indians had a temporary camp here. So this is what the post looked like, uh, more or less, four years later when uh, the battle we're going to talk about took place. Uh, next, please. Before we talk about the battle, though, I want to talk some more about, now that we know where we are, about who we're talking about. This is a, a marine historical uh, uh, replica of uh, a, uh, a, an expedition that came down the Mississippi River in 1778, led by a fellow named uh, James Willing. He was actually an American naval captain who had been commissioned by uh, a committee of the uh, uh, Continental Congress to come down the Mississippi River and raid those settlements along 
the east bank of the Mississippi that I just identified as, uh, as English. In other words, he was an officer uh, in the service of the Continental Congress during the American Revolution. And he came down the Mississippi River to raid the loyalist British outposts in West Florida. Uh, he, in fact, destroyed that little settlement that I'm talking about, Concordia, and ran everybody off in order to try to get rid of the British influence in the area. It was, it was quite a small settlement, but it, it was having some impact on the Quapaw Indians and threatening, uh, their, uh, threatening their loyalty to the, to the Spaniards and the French who were living here in Arkansas. <clears throat> the, uh, the Commandant of Arkansas Post actually connived into the destruction of Concordia. Uh, he wasn't supposed to because at this time, Spain did not yet join the Americans in the American Revolution. They were officially neutral, although everybody knew that they were really helping the Americans. And the Commandant of Arkansas Post did that. He did it in an active way, although he didn't send troops over there. He supplied uh, uh, Willing with munitions and intelligence and probably some guides to take him back to Concordia and destroy it. So the American Revolution came to Arkansas Post in a kind of oblique way as early as 1778. Uh, uh, next, please. Now, in 1783, it was five years later, in 1783, that Arkansas Post actually got attacked. Now, I want to talk a little more here about the Hoops. Again, who would, could be expected to defend the Arkansas Post at this time? Well, there were three main groups. One was uh, the Spanish garrison at the post. This is a Spanish uh, soldier, this is a Spanish drummer, this is a Spanish uh, officer. They were all soldiers of what was called the Spanish Fixed Infantry Regiment of Louisiana. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> they garrisoned the post about 1770 and stay here until around, well, until 1804. Now, in addition to the regular Spanish garrison, these are regular soldiers, they were also militiamen. Now, the militia was very important to the defense of Louisiana and most parts of the colony because there were very few garrison troops. What was a militia? Well, you didn't join the militia, you were in it. If you were, if you were able-bodied and free and male, and between the ages of 15 and 50, you were subject to being called up into the militia. It's kind of the forerunner of our National Guard, okay? But the commandant at the post could call you into service at any time. They had, he had to pay you, they had to feed you, but you were liable to service. This lady here, uh, uh, this, this is uh, a, a kind of a tableau of the people who defended St. Louis when they were attacked by the British in 1780. This lady here, was the wife of a militia officer, and when he got, uh, when, when he was wounded, she put his coat on and helped, uh, helped defend St. Louis. These, these people are militia cavalrymen. They're not relevant to Arkansas, but we didn't have a cavalry unit. Uh, the matter is, we didn't have a very large militia unit. Could I have the next, please? Uh, but just, just to show you how important the militia was, this is a portrait of a militia officer in New Orleans. And when he came to have his picture painted by Jose Salazar, who was a famous portrait painter in, uh, in, in New Orleans and uh, painted all the grandees down there, he chose to be painted in his militia uniform. It was a very high social and political office, and people vied to become officers in the militia. Next, please. This is another militia officer named Pierre Rousseau. Yeah, as it happens, he came to Arkansas Post in 1791. But this, again, shows that he chose to have his portrait painted when it came time to have that done in his militia uniform, despite the fact that he was also an officer in the Spanish Army at one time. He thought this was, maybe he liked the uniform better, I don't know. But it, was, it, was more, it had more cachet, it had more panache in the, in the society at the time. So the militia was extremely important to the defense of Louisiana, especially during the American Revolution. Next, please. And there was a little militia unit even down in Camden, by the way, associated with what is now Monroe, Louisiana. 
and this is the, uh, the, the, the list, the muster list of 1783, the very, the very uh, year that the Arkansas Post was attacked. And you'll see there's quite a number of people there, uh, but they're too far away to help Arkansas Post. The only way to get to uh, the only way to get to Monroe was to was, was uh, or to Camden was on uh, the very uncertain trails, uh, unreliable. And you had to cross a lot of rivers, so there was no no chance that anybody from uh, Camden was going to come up here and help us. So, how about Arkansas Post itself? Well, Arkansas Post at this time had a population of maybe. 50 or 60 resident Europeans. So they might have had 15 militiamen available, okay? Not very many. There were a lot of hunters in the area, though, and they were subject to being called up by, uh, into the militia. And they were, there may have been as many as 50 or 100 of those, but they were very reluctant and unreliable soldiers because they had to be out on their campaigns half the year. They had to be out hunting. If they weren't out hunting, they, they had no income. And so it was hard to get them to come to Buster's. So the Commandant at Arkansas Post uh, in 1782, right before he was attacked, had a muster here at Arkansas Post, but he could only get about 40 people to show up. So he had 15 resident Frenchmen, 40 people who were not, who were, who were in, in total resident and who were available to defend the post. Uh, and next, please. But the third contingent, we talked about the garrison, we talked about the militia, which had two parts really. There was a third possibility that the commandant could look to for defense purposes, and that was the Quapaw Indians. They had been allies to the French during many of French, uh, the, the wars that the French uh, fought in the 18th century, and they were allied with the Spanish as well. So the Spanish thought they could count on the Quapaws. You can see them here. Uh, this is a painted bubble line. There's a huge, big replica of it out here in front, yeah, out in the building that you need to take a look at. And this is showing the Clawpaws uh, uh, defeating the Chickasaws here. That's familiar, right? The Clawpaws against the Chickasaws has been going on for a long time. And this, by the way, up here is Arkansas Post. It's an actual picture of Arkansas Post. This was painted about 1740. Uh, so those were the three components. Uh, that could possibly come to the defense of the post. So let's see what happened. Next, please. This is what Arkansas Post, this is a very idealized rendering of what Arkansas Post looked like in 1793 when the attack came. It's got a lot of uh, very accurate uh, portions. The fort itself is accurately predicted, the number uh, of painted uh, and depicted, the number of buildings is correct. We're not really sure where the village was at this time, but this is. Not, you know, this is a possibility. Uh, anyway, this is the, this is the peninsula that's still down there in the main. This is the post bio right here. We know this bluff. Anyone who walks around here, this is the very bluff that's still there. And most of the site of the fort, I think, is still uh, above water. <coughs> Next, please. This will show you what the houses actually looked like. Uh, there were maybe 10 of these at the post. At the, at the, well, not, not this fancy. Five or six is fancy at the post in 1783. This house still stands in St. Jeremy, Missouri. It's called the Beckett Rebow House. And it's worth a visit. It's really a wonderful place. So, next please. This is a map of how James Colbert, who was a, an American who had lived among the Chickasaws, decided to attack the post. This, this is probably not very, it's, 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 I would say it was, it, it will do as a, as a kind of uh, facsimile of what happened. It's not a historical, it's not historically accurate, but it, it'll, it, it will help you understand what happened. Well, who was James Colbert anyway? You know, since this, is, this place is always associated with the French, there's always a temptation for people to call this man Colbert. Well, no, he wasn't. He was a Scot. He was, he was an American, but he was of Scotch ancestry. And he called himself Colbert. Actually, he probably called himself Colbert, because that's the way you pronounce the name. I'll call him Colbert because that's what everybody calls him these days. And I can never remember to say Colbert. So anyway, James Colbert had lived among the Chickasaw Indians. Remember, they were over there on the English side, and they were allied with the English. Uh, you can think of this as a battle 
as being Ole Miss against the Hawks, right? <laughs> you've, got, you've got the Chickasaw Indians and uh, the, uh, uh, the English over on the Ole Miss side, and you've got the Spanish over here on, on the Hawks side. So we've had this rivalry going now for many centuries. But he came down the Arkansas River the night of April 16, 1783, and landed, he probably landed more up here, and, uh, and he attacked the post. He had, uh, he, was, he was quite a wealthy man. He claimed he had a two-story house and owned 150 slaves. Lived among uh, Chickasaw for 40 years. He had three Chickasaw wives in succession, and so he had a lot of Chickasaw sons who fought with him. He had a kind of a private army, uh, and he had been raiding ships, uh, and, uh, Spanish ships on the Mississippi River, and, and bragging about how he was going to attack Arkansas Post for quite some time, and then finally he did. Well, uh, when he, he landed somewhere around here probably, he had a flotilla of four boats. He had what's called a bateau, which is a little keel boat. He had a flat boat, he had two canoes. He had 82 men, 66 white people, 11 Chickasaw Métis, that is mixed blood sons of his, mixed blood uh, white and Indian, and five blacks. Uh, most, of the, uh, <clears throat> most of the white people were Americans or British, or there was one Frenchman, I don't know how he got in the act. But anyway, there were 82 of those who landed in the flotilla somewhere around here. And the first thing they did was attack the little village where the resident militiamen uh, were, were, uh, were, were, were living. He attacked about 2.30 in the morning. Uh, without warning, it was a lightning strike. Uh, next, please. And the first thing he did was go to the cabins where the uh, militiamen lived. Uh, there were 10 families living there at the time. And he captured four of the families immediately. And the other six ran off into the woods. So he had neutralized the local militia immediately with his lightning strike. What about the other component of the militia, the hunters? They were nowhere to be seen because it, although it was early April, they were still out in the woods on their campaign. So the civilian force on which the Louisiana government generally depended so heavily for defensive purposes was put out of business. So he's, he's doing pretty well. I'm sure, I'm sure he thought he was, he, he was headed uh, toward, a, toward a victory. About the same time when this fracas was going on, the people up at the fort could hear all the noise, of course. So they sent uh, a patrol out to see what was happening. And it was commanded by a man named, uh, a sergeant named Alejo Pastor. He had not and ward off the attackers, but he was overwhelmed. He lost two men, two were killed, one was wounded, the other six were captured. He made it back to the fort somehow and clambered through a cannon embrasure and got back to the fort. We'll hear more about him in a minute. So, it was onto the fort. So, next slide, please. This is what the fort looked like. This is an artist's depiction of it. Uh, who was inside the fort? Well, as I said, the garrison was there. The garrison was 70 men at this time, which was quite a large force. This was the largest force the Arkansas Post had ever had. Uh, and the fort had just been reinforced, and new cannons had been brought up, and the old ones were prepared. From Natchez and uh, a sergeant who was actually expert in, in, in uh, uh, artillery had come up to train everybody. In other words, the fort was at the ready. This was probably the, the strongest outpost that Arkansas Post ever had. And why Colbert picked this particular time to attack, I have no idea. It's obvious that his intelligence was so good. Anyway, he attacked the fort, uh, but he was not able to take it. Uh, the, uh, the, the, stock, the stockade was new, and the reports say that the, the carbines that the English force uh, uh, was using against the fort, just, the, the bullets just embedded themselves harmlessly in the, in the oak, uh, in, in the oak uh, stockade. And in the meantime, the artillery was busy uh, uh, holding Culver's force down in a uh, ravine. They fired over 300 rounds of cannons uh, uh, during this battle from their four-pounders. They had several four-pound cannons. Four-pound cannon, you'll know, was a cannon that fired a four-pound uh, shell. 
It's not a cannon that weighs four pounds. <laughs> and then they had some, what they call swivel guns, too. They had three or four of those, probably. With some smaller, smaller little cannons on a swivel base. That they, they might have been one pounders. They might have even been smaller. Anyway, over 300 cannon rounds were, were fired. And so there was a kind of stalemate until about mm, 8.30 in the morning. The battle had been going on for six hours. Uh, a woman named Madame Villar shows up at the gate of the fort with a note from Colbert demanding, demanding the surrender of the fort. He says, I've got artillery coming up and I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to destroy your fort if you don't surrender. And she was accompanied by a fellow with a white flag. About the time she got up with, with her note, the doors of the fort opened and guess who came running out? Alejo Pastor. Remember him? He was a guy who had just been defeated a few hours earlier down on the riverbank. And he came running out of the fort with 10 Spanish soldiers and four Quapaw Indians who just happened to be in the fort at the time spending the night. See how friendly they were? I mean, they not only trusted the Indians, they were, there was a certain amount of intermarriage. So he had 10 Spanish soldiers and four Quapaw Indians, and they came running out like there was a whole tribe. There was after whooping and hollering, and the, the, the English were deathly afraid of combat with the Indians. So they hightailed it. Next, please. I mean, this, 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 is, uh, they, this is what won the battle, this Spanish and uh, Qualpaw uh, Sally from the fort uh, won the battle, and Culver's band uh, uh, hightailed it down the, uh, the Arkansas River. Uh, <clears throat> let's see now. Uh, next, please. I want to show you here, I've got a little party favor. This is, it's uh, always fun to see what these documents look like, or at least it's fun for me, but I'm a little strange. Uh, and uh, these are service records from the archive in Spain, which holds the records of all the Spanish soldiers who served uh, in the uh, colonial period. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you, Teresa. Thank you very much. Hand those out. This, this, this is the record. If you'll turn to the second one of these, there, I've got three. The first one is a commandant. I'm not going to read that to you, but I'll, you can keep these to yourself for your amusement. Use your uh, wives and friends, girlfriends, and whatever. Uh, but th this is a service record of a lot of pastor. <laughs> The second one, and uh, what it says here, uh, up, up here you can see it says, Lieutenant Don Alejo, Alejo Pastor, he was 52 years old. But here's his service record here that's, that's relevant to us. Uh, he found himself in the fort, uh, he called it, they called it San Carlos, which, well, that's not the name. The real name was Carlos III, it was named after the king. But occasionally you see it called San Carlos, I don't know why. Anyways, he found himself in the fort of San Carlos of Arkansas. See, there you go, got Arkansas spelled with a Z in 17, uh, uh, this record was made. Uh, 1797. 1797. Uh, uh, which, having been attacked by the enemies, they didn't quite know who to call them, so they just called them the enemies. Uh, in the year 1783, see that? He contributed, meaning Pastor contributed uh, to its defense, that is, the defense of the fort, and he chased them off. He repulsed them. Uh, as a result of his service during this battle, he was promoted from sergeant. You see here he was sergeant. Uh, he was promoted to a sub lieutenant in 1784 as a reward for his service and as a commendation for all he had done and he became a sergeant. This was pretty, this was not uncommon, but it was a, it was a pretty big step from becoming, he was a soldier, just a plain soldier in 1764, and he made it all the way to the rank of lieutenant, which is uh, a certain amount of upper mobility in the Spanish Army, but this shows you how much they appreciated his service. Now, after the battle, this gentleman shows up with a 
force of soldiers in a convoy <coughs> coming up to Mississippi anyway. Learning, having learned about what happened at the fort, uh, he, picked, he, uh, uh, he uh, uh, collected a force of about 100 Quapaw warriors and went off down the river in search of Colbert's band. He found them up in Memphis, hanging around Sigasaw Bluffs, where they liked, liked the base, and he defeated Colbert. Uh, at that time, Colbert had a flotilla of maybe six months. But anyway, that was the end of, of Colbert and, and, and his whole scheme. And by the way, where were the Guapaw Indians all this time? Remember, they were the third group we thought we might depend on. Well, they didn't show up. And the Spanish were furious. So when the chief shows up about noon, the battle ended about 9 o'clock. <laughs> chief shows up about noon and says, uh, uh, the commandant says, well, where, where in the heck have you been? I'm cleaning this up a little bit, right? Where, where in the heck have you been? He said, it was a very interesting story, and I've written a long article about it. I won't bore you the whole thing. But he said, look, some people showed up last night. These Chickasaws that I knew, these half, half, half bloods I was telling you about, French, uh, I mean, uh, English Chickasaw half bloods who were in Culver's band. They showed up, came to my house, said, we're going to go up to the post and shake hands with the commandant, have a good time, just a diplomatic visit. And he believed them, he said. So while he was entertaining them in his hut, the main force, he said, sneaked past the villages. The villages were supposed to be kind of a dew line, you know, early warning dew line. And, but he said they sneaked past. It was, it was, you know, it was like 1 o'clock in the morning, and they had their oars muffled. And the oarlocks muffled. They, they were on the other. They, they, they heard the back on the other side, and we couldn't hear, even hear them, much less see them. Well, that's his story, and it's plausible. And he said, furthermore, you know, most of my men are out hunting. Well, the commandant had to know that was true because his own men were out hunting. His own hunters didn't show up. How can you expect the Quapaws to show up, right? Uh, and uh, uh, but. They did join later uh, in, in, the, in the hunt for Culver to the volume led, as I said. There's, there's a lot more to the story, of course. One of the Quapaw chiefs, there were three village chiefs in addition to the big chief. And the confederation was loose, and the big chief didn't have power over his warriors the way a, a European-style military commandant would have. He can't just say, okay, boys, we're going. There's got a lot of conferencing as to conferring has to take place first. But anyway, one of the village chiefs, a couple of years later, when a Spaniard asked, you know, where the heck were you? He said, well, let me tell you, I didn't really get much of a, a signal from the great chief. And he said, and by the way, I'm not in the habit of fighting white men's wars. <laughs> in other words, what he was saying essentially was, we didn't have a dog in that fight. Mm -hmm. So who knows? I mean, the truth is, I'm sure there are lots of reasons they didn't show up. But the main thing is they didn't show up. Next, please. Now, this is the service record of Valier. By the way, uh, Don Joseph Valier, who became commandant in 1788 at Arkansas Post, has a great, 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 great grandson who lives in Little Rock, whose name is French Hill, who is our congressman. So you see, we're still being still being ruled by these people <laughs> over 200, you know, almost 250 years later. Anyway, here's his service record. Uh, this was a uh, this was a couple together in 1795. Uh, he was in a party in the Congo in the convoy. Remember, I said he was coming up the river in a convoy, which was going up to the Illinois. That's what that's what the uh, this would have been uh, St. Louis and uh, Kaskaskia, those places up, uh, up the Mississippi River. Uh, in, uh, in the year 1783, he was going, going up to Illinois in 1783, and on the 12th of June of the same year, he, uh, they attacked a party of English pirates. The Spanish regarded Colbert as a pirate because he was raiding shipping on the Mississippi River. They didn't really think he had a commission. He claimed he had a British commission. He actually had a commission from uh, the, uh, uh, from, from the, 
military commandant of West Florida, but he didn't have a commission from the king. He brought a privateer then? Yeah, he, he really wasn't pockets here, exactly. And, and so, and then he says, they attacked the, the English pirates at the bluffs, a coal. That, that's Chickasaw Bluffs. That's Memphis. And he uh, chased them off. He repelled, he repulsed them. Uh, he, 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 got, uh, he got promoted uh, later on to a rank of a lieutenant colonel as a result of his service uh, during the American Revolution. That was largely, uh, largely honorary title. They didn't come with any more money, so I think he was all that real good. And now we're about to the next place. I want to show you, this is Valier's daughter. Uh, she uh, was not at the post at the time of the attack. She wasn't born until 1790. But <clears throat> she was uh, uh, a resident of Arkansas Post and uh, married to a fellow named Francois Vosine, who was a, mil a militia captain of the 1790s, very prominent family. And so I just wanted to, to, uh, to see what some of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, women at the post looked like. They actually didn't wear these dresses on formal occasions down here. And uh, the fact when the Protestants came in and started uh, preaching on Sundays, the French ladies would come into the back of the church dressed like this. The reason they were dressed like this was that after their mass is when they had their parish meetings and their, and their parties and their auctions and their, and their balls. So they were all dressed up to go to the party, which scandalized all the Presbyterians, of course, who, couldn't, who thought it was a, they were Sabbath players. So anyway, uh, next, uh, next please, you will, you will see that, that is, I've now come to a blessed end. I, I'm not exhausted. I don't know about it, but I'm exhausted by the audience, and thanks for your quiet patience. I appreciate it. Answer questions if, 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 if we have time. If not, yeah. that's fine too. If you all want to leave, go ahead. I got a U.S. Marshal out there to arrest you. <laughs> don't worry about that. Yeah. Okay. So at the fort, aside from the military folks that were here, what about the kids? What would be like the daily activities? For kids? For kids and for women. I mean, well, that's, sure that's, a, a, that's a great question. Uh, there, the uh, officers had their wives here, uh, and, uh, and sometimes their children, not always. A few wives, the, the officers uh, served typically only a few years. They were what I call an itinerant gentry. They moved about from post to post. They were high-class people, most of noble families. Uh, but they, did, they were allowed to have their wives. There's no evidence that the Spaniards, Spanish soldiers ever had any wives on just the French. Just the, just the officers. You know, you know, not, even, not, not even the French either. I mean, no evidence, in other words, that the common soldier had wives and children. If they had them, they would have left them, out, left them behind in New Orleans where the headquarters were. So there were a few children. And of course, there were children among the civilians who lived here. We don't know, we know almost nothing about them. There were no schools. Okay, that's my next question. Yeah, there were no schools. Uh, the, uh, uh, there were very few priests. When there was a priest at Arkansas Post, he would have he would have given elementary lessons in reading and writing, for, just for catechism purposes. But uh, any, anyone who uh, wanted an actual formal education for the children would have to send them to New Orleans. That last lady I showed you went to the Ursuline Convent School in New Orleans, where a lot of the upper class women were educated. So she had a, a definite advantage. But uh, otherwise, they, they were homeschooled. In other words, the parents taught them. Right. There's, there's a possibility that a private tutor might have been hired at one time. The first evidence of a schoolmaster in the Arkansas Post that I know of is on a map uh, from uh, 1832. And he was, he, was, uh, he was hanging out at the only inn in town. So that's probably where his schoolroom was. But that's the first schoolroom I know of. There was no, there was no there was no formal, there was no formal education. And we really don't know anything at all about the lives of the children. Anything else? Well, one thing I wasn't, uh, maybe I missed it in there, but uh, the reason 
Colbert or Colbert raided the police. Was it just to get just to get the the, the, the French out of the area, or was there a uh, another? Yeah, a good question. It, uh, it, was, it was part of the effort. The uh, the Spanish had joined the Americans mm -hmm. uh, against the English during the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. I know they, they didn't. They supported our war effort, mm -hmm. but the Spanish weren't interested in creating a republic yeah. because they were, they were a monarchy. Mm -hmm. They were they were interested in defeating the British and getting some of the stuff back that they lost in the Seven Years' War. So, uh, Colbert uh, uh, was part of that Spanish, part of the uh, English effort to defeat the Spanish. Uh, and, but more specifically, he was trying to get some people who had been arrested in Natchez for their uh, uh, anti-Spanish activities released. But when they asked him, what, why are you here? He said, well, I'm here to raid, and I'm here to pillage, and I'm here to capture. He did capture a lot of the people at the post, and a number of soldiers, and they, most of them were rescued, but not all of them. So that's, it was, that's what it was about. Yeah. So anything else? anyway, I, I'm, I'll be outside here. Some of you no doubt need to be released, so I'll do that, but I do want to give, I'll give you a, a little synopsis. This is a, uh, a chapter in a book that's about to come out. There's, a, there's an exhibit going up in St. Charles, Missouri, just north of St. Louis, uh, next month, about the American Revolution, north, I mean west of the Mississippi. And, this is, and there's a book that's coming out in connection with that exhibit, and it's got a chapter on Arkansas Post. Which I wrote. I wanted to make sure we got in the book. And this is the, this is the chapter. So this way you don't have to buy the book. But don't tell them, all right? <laughs> this, by the way, was uh, one of two American Revolutionary War battles fought west of Mississippi. The other was in St. Louis. Uh, the people in St. Louis say it wasn't wasn't part of the American Revolution because it was fought after the treaty. Well, it was only fought after the preliminary treaty. And it, by the way, it's, uh, it's the westernmost battle. One, one other little factoid I'll let you go. Uh, believe it or not, if you look at the map, Natchez is actually west of Arkansas Post. Hmm. <laughs> the river goes in, it creates a kind of little, little underbelly there from the mm -hmm. Mississippi. So, and Natchez did, was taken over by the Spanish during the American Revolution. But there wasn't a battle there. <laughs> So I saved myself by saying, well, well, I'm saying it was the westernmost battle of the American Revolution, not the westernmost event. Okay. Anyway, thank you all for listening. Thank you. <laughs>